Welcome and thank you for joining this webinar brought to you by Chemical Computing Group, New Chem Sciences and Grid Markets. Today's webinar, Molecular Modeling in the Cloud, a Turnkey Solution for Scalable Sims, is the third of our three-part series featuring powerful collaborative molecular simulation and screen tools. Over the next hour, we will explore how Chemical Computing Group and New Chem Sciences leveraged grid markets to accelerate their drug discovery results for particularly challenging projects. First, Chemical Computing Group will present their case study on modeling proteolysis targeting chimeric systems, also known as protax, at scale. Then New Chem Sciences will share how their use of MO via grid markets helped to solve extremely difficult synthetic challenges by the identification of novel hits through a focused screening, virtual screening campaign. My name is Wendy Neiman, and I'll be your moderator for our time together today. First, we'll start out with a brief presentation from Doyle Oakey with Grid Markets we will discuss grid markets molecular simulation screening services. Then we'll hear from our guest speakers, Michael Drummond, Scientific Applications Manager with Chemical Computing Group, and Ivan Franzoni, chem Computational Chemist at New Chem Sciences. Finally, we'll wrap up with a Q&A session at the end. Your mics were muted upon entry, so please drop your questions in the Zoom Q&A tab located at the bottom right of your screen. And now without further delay, I'm pleased to introduce our first presenter, Doyle Oakey, PhD. Doyle is based in Boise, Idaho, and is Vice President of Global Sales with Grid Markets. Grid Markets offers a secure molecular simulation and screening service, which Doyle will describe in more detail. Doyle, thank you for joining us today. Thanks, Wendy. Good morning, everyone from beautiful Boise, Idaho. I hope it's an equally lovely day where you are. Today, of course, we're focused on grid markets and service with a specific focus on CCG's MO and how to bring that to scale. But just a brief reminder that our service also includes Amber, NAMD, Gromax, and soon to announce Quantum Bio. Grid markets is purpose built to power drug discovery at scale. How do we do that? Unlimited MO tokens and machines. Setup is so simple, even I can do it. No annual fee, you pay by the drink with all-inclusive pricing and an ultra secure AWS and Oracle cloud. Give us a try at your convenience. You can find the free trial at pharma.gridmarkets.com forward slash mo. And now for the important part of the show, take it away, Michael. Thank you, Doyle. Next up, it's my pleasure to introduce Michael Drummond, PhD, Scientific Applications Manager with Chemical Computing Group. Michael obtained his PhD in inorganic chemistry from The Ohio State University. After postdocs at Oak Ridge National Laboratory and the University of North Texas, he joined Chemical Computing Group in 2013, where he currently serves as Scientific Application Manager. Michael is going to guide us through a Chemical Computing Group case study focused on the modeling of Protax, where the setup of a high-performance mill calculation was completed in four simple steps using the grid market service. Over to you, Michael. All right, thank you very much, Wendy. Uh, before I get started on today's case study, I did want to present one slide about Chemical Computing Group. Uh, CCG was founded in 1994, so we were coming up on 30 years of being in the scientific software business. We have offices in Canada, in Montreal, in the UK, Germany, uh, Japan, and uh, through a partner in China as well. Our flagship product is known as MO, Molecular Operating Environment, and this is the software that I will be showing today to do PROTAC modeling, but we also do, this is the software we use to do biologics modeling, small molecule modeling, docking. It's really, we, we don't operate by selling different parts of scientific modeling software. We sell one package and that is MO, and it's an open architecture. So you can do all of these, you just click in different menus. You don't have to, to ask us for, to, to purchase other pieces of software for us. One of the things we're particularly proud of with Moan and at CCG is our collaborative customer support. And this doesn't just involve emails and, and Zooms and things like that. It also involves custom scripts and custom tools that are suited to meet your particular purposes. And in fact, the ProTac tools I'll show you today have come out of an effort across many different companies to develop a tool uh, to do what scientists needed them to do. So in, in a sense, what I'm showing you today was actually somewhat cloud sourced to, to develop this application. 
Now, you've heard me mention PROTEX before. You heard Wendy mention it as well. It's one of those uh, acronyms that doesn't exactly tell you what it is unless you already know what it is, so, so let's go through it. It stands for proteolysis targeting chimera. And here I've just shown an image of uh, the chimera from Greek mythology. You can see it's kind of an unusual, but certainly intimidating and powerful looking creature. And I would say that the, the protax themselves kind of fit that same description. They are small molecules and really you can break them down into three parts. On the left hand side here shown in blue, these are the parts of the protax that interact with your molecule, your, your, your protein rather that you were trying to affect. And we'll talk about what that means when I say affect on the next slide. On the other side, on the right, this is the part of the protax that binds to a particular enzyme known as an E3 ligase. There are over 600 different varieties of E3 ligases in the human body. I'm showing some binders that interact with two of the most commonly utilized, uh, VHL and Cerebron. And then connecting these two ends, you have a linker, which as you can see here is generally a flexible, longish type linker, but it doesn't necessarily have to be. Now, the reason you, if you've heard about Protex, the reason it, it is somewhat of a buzzword, it's because they work very differently in the human body as opposed to a traditional inhibition driven system. So what a Protex does is it brings into close proximity your targeted protein and this E3 ligase enzyme that I mentioned on the last slide. Now, it, in the natural body, it, E3 ligase, its endogenous role is to degrade proteins, but they're really tuned for just one or, or maybe a, a small handful full of different proteins. Through the PROTAC and through designing it, we are forcing this E3 ligase to get close to our protein, whichever protein we want. And so once you form this complex, which we call the ternary or three-body complex, that would be one, your targeted protein, two, the PROTAC itself, and three, this E3 ligase assembly, nature takes over and ubiquitins are transferred from the E3 ligase to the targeted protein. And once you get three or four, that's the native signal for this protein to be sent off to the proteasome to be degraded. So you see, it's very different from just kind of gumming up the pocket of your target protein. You're actually degrading the protein, which has obvious ramifications. Uh, you have to resynthesize the protein, for example, if it's going to show a deleterious effect. Now, the system I wanted to choose to, to work with grid markets to demonstrate is based on this paper here uh, from the Journal of MedChem uh, in 2019. And I explicitly showed the header of this paper because you can see there's nearly 20 scientists and you have all these little symbols with all their different affiliations. My point is this was a lot of work that went into this study. They essentially, they, they ran the gamut with their, their molecules here. They started with designing and synthesizing their protac molecules and they took it all the way up to actually measuring some of these protacs in xenografted tumor, uh, tumor xenografted onto, onto mice. So they did pretty much everything you can short of actually taking it to the clinic, which they've, they've since started to do. The, the target, the, what the protein we're trying to affect in this system or, or that uh, Joe et al are trying to affect is known as STAT3. It is like, like many proteins, it is a cancer target. And this is an interesting system because originally they thought that STAT3 showed a, 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 was implicated in cancer as this big green protein here kind of dimerizes. And so the, the thought was, well, we can build a small molecule, kind of, a, you can see here in magenta, kind of a biggish small molecule. But nonetheless, if we can put it at the point where we know these two proteins will stick together, maybe that'll stop it from causing tumors. Turns out further research showed that even the monomer, so without having to, to form that protein-protein that interface, is still active in, two, in, in cancerogenesis. So the, this is actually kind of a silver lining. This is a nice system for Protex because now we don't have to worry about monomer or dimer or you know, high order oligomer. We could just degrade it and, and, and just knock it out of cancer entirely. And so the system they came up with, the Protex system they came up with, is, here's, here's one of the, the parent molecules. And they built a library of 24 Protex based on this parent molecule here. And they optimized these systems, or they came up with their library exactly how you would think they would do it. Uh, they just went piece by piece and, and looked at different possibilities. So for example, the linker here, every time you build a protect, it's necessary to optimize your linker, the part that connects your protein binder, your, your target binder, and your E3 ligase binder, that, that's the linker. And so they went through a library of uh, about a dozen different linkers and they just looked at different possibilities and they, they found one that, that, that gave the best uh, degradation. It's a, it's a value known as DC50. It's, it's similar to IC50 if you're familiar with that. If you're not, the lower, the better. 
So they, they found their particular linker that they liked. And then they went to the next stop and they looked at uh, the, the next portion of the molecule and they, they chose different R groups and, and found one they liked. And similarly with these other parts as well. And so if you count up all the different entries that I've shown here, which I just exerted, excerpted, took from the paper, um, you'll see that there are 24. And so this was my original case study that I actually performed using Mo, and I'll show you how to set this up in just a moment. Uh, and I did this just as a, as a sanity check on my home computer. Now this home computer is it's, uh, it's about eight years old and it has eight cores, so it's, it's, it's still doing okay. The main disadvantage of my home computer is it is my home computer, so my kids use it as well. And so if I use up too much of it, then they can't watch their, their YouTube and all that, uh, so I get yelled at. So I can only use half of it. So to long story short, to simulate these 24 protects on my local compute resources, uh, it took just under a day. And the technique I used is something we call method 4B. I present an entire webinar about method 4B. So obviously I, I can't do that today. Long story short, nutshell version, there are three steps of method 4B. The first step was we do protein-protein docking of in this case, STAT3 and Cerebron, just to find out what the protein-protein interface might look like. Second step is we take each one of those 24 protacks, generate confirmations of each one of those. And then the third step is we mush these two ensembles together to create ternary complexes. And so what you get out, look, this is just an example of one set of ternary complexes for one of the proteins. Uh, so it, it gives you a view of what the system looks like. And the, the reason I'm showing different ones is there is a bit of fuzziness. There's a bit of imprecision in the protein-protein interface, but it's still very useful and very workable. In addition to these structures, you also get a score for method 4B. And so what I'm showing here is just these are the six protacks that method 4B, our computational model, thought were the best. And these, these are just our compound identifiers. They're the structures of these protacks needn't concern us right now. But what we, we can do is, since this is a retrospective study, we can look at the experimental results as well. And so I'm going to plot those in a, on the y-axis. I'm plotting the experimental values. So again, lower is better. And I've color-coded them to help us uh, quickly analyze these things. So anything in green is kind of the best of the best by the experimental results. Anything in yellow is kind of middling, and any red protect, any red bars we see will be ineffective to graders. And so you can see for the first quartile, the six out of 24 that we predicted to be the best, we got five, five of them were actually the best, and then the sixth one was, was a middling one. As we take a look at the second, third, and fourth quartiles, you can see the second quartile, that's all good stuff. And then you can see the, the middling and poor ones generally fall to the bottom half of our prediction. So there's some quibbling we can do with these results. Uh, we, we certainly did get the three best experimental protacts were in quartile one, so that's a good sign. We do have a, a, a false positive in our first quartile, and you know we have some false negatives, ones that we would have liked to have predicted to be better. But like I say, long story short, I feel like our modeling on this initial test set has it, got a handle on this. I feel like we've recapitulated known results, which gives me confidence as we move into modeling new protacts. And I'm going to do that not with my home computer, but instead with grid markets. Uh, there are souped up heavy duty compute power. So I can really, the, kind of the sky's the limit. And I can do designing and exploring of new protects to my heart's content. So as we get into that, there's a number of different things we could do to expand upon this 24 member library. Um, first of all, we could, you know, we could very quickly just add you know, just draw new molecules and decide that we want to add them to optimizing the linker or, or various other regions. Instead, what I decided to do in, with this particular system using grid markets uh, technology is to, to just really lean into the fact that I've shown a 2D diagram here of this protac, but of course we all know that that is not what it looks like in 3D. And, and so what I mean by that in particular is these various parts interact with each other. We, uh, of course, we know that the linker can interact with the, the Cerebron binder because they're, they're covalently linked to each other. But as you start looking at confirmations that we made in this initial test set, you'll see that the other parts of the molecules can also interact with each other as well. So it's pretty easy to find confirmations where this yellow phosphate group uh, bearing moiety can interact with the linker or the Cerebron binder. The, the, the green part on the clear other end of the molecule can actually wrap around and interact, and you can even find the green part interacting with the linker as well. 
So my point with this is not to, not to tell us all something we all know, it's to, to point out that there is a limitation in the experimental technique that Joe et al. did, where they just optimized each one of these pieces one by one. I will say they, they, they pretty much had to do it that way because if you were to look at all sorts of different combinations to really capture this effect, it is a combinatorial problem. And so very quickly you go from 24 protacks to a lot more, but with grid markets uh, compute power, we can actually do that rather quickly computationally. And so I just went for it. I said, you know what? Let's not limit ourselves to this one by one, this piecemeal optimization approach. Instead, let's just make all combinations of each one of these moieties. So the math is four times three times 11 times four. And then we, we already had 19 of those in, in the 24 original uh, test set. So now we're looking at a new library of 509 Protax. So it's, it's 21 times bigger than our initial set of 24 Protax. So if I were to do those 509 new Protax on my home compute, on my home four cores, so I don't get yelled at by the kids, we're looking at over half a month to do that. And that, that's a lot of getting yelled at for, for, not, for my kids not being able to watch YouTube. So I did not want to do that, nor, nor did I really want to scale back my, my, my problem here. What is instead I wanted to do was use grid markets technology. So very quickly, I'm going to jump out of PowerPoint and I want to show you how easy it is to set up. Doyle told you that it was easy and Mark and, and Doyle and the other folks at Grid Markets told me that as well when we first started this. But, you know, I wanted to see it for myself. So let's go ahead and show you what that looks like. I have Mo open here and I'm just very quickly going to open up my two, uh, my two proteins with kind of uh, parts of the protag in their binding site. Now, how we set this up, again, that, that's a subject for another webinar. If, if you're interested, surely let me know. We'll, we'll have, uh, I'll have my contact information on the slide at various points throughout the presentation here. Uh, but essentially what we have to do, first of all, is use Mo to set these up and then use one of our ProTac tools in Mo. You see, we, we, you see we have a number of them. The one I like to use for my, my modeling purposes is known as method 4B, as I mentioned. And so if we launch method 4B, you get a panel, which is really just looking for you to input uh, your, your, the parts of your system and then a few options. I, I can't take a whole lot of time to explain what goes into this, but I can very quickly say, this is going to be my library of 509 new Protax, which I, I actually made all those combinations using a different tool in Mo, known as our combinatorial builder, to very quickly do make those, uh, those combinations of different R groups. Once I did that, now we just need to, to input, let's say our, our protein, that, that's gonna be this green one, our target protein with part of the binder in the pocket. And then similarly, Cerebron, that's our E3 ligase with its binder in the pocket. One option I have to change, and this is almost ready for grid markets. Well, we'll skip all the other options. The, the one thing I have to point out is that when I use that browse button, it is putting a path to my local machine which I am not going to be executing this on. This is a laptop I'm looking. So th this would take, this would take, a, surely it would take a month to, to do this. So instead, what I have to do is just remove the path so it only shows the file name. And I'm just kind of deleting the, the various parts of it. That now we're ready to go. Now I can encapsulate these various settings with this little button here called generate batch file. I'll just save it to that particular file name. And now that's, uh, now from Mo, I can actually launch our grid markets interface. Grid markets interfaces with Mo through a tool they call Envoy. And here is the Mo interface to kind of set up Envoy. So it, there, there's actually not a whole lot I tend to change on this panel. You can give it a project name. I'll just call it like webinar. And then, so I don't get confused. I give the project and submission the, the same name. Um, and then essentially from this list here, you pick that file that we just made that saved all the options. And then th this part's a little tricky, just a little tricky. Um, so I, I do wanna go through this. We want to run this method 4B, this little script file I just made saving all my options in parallel. And so to do that, uh, we have to add a, a, a command line option to, to our run, which is MPU32. And 32 is because the grid market uh, computer we'll be using has 32 uh, threads, uh, 32 cores. And so that's what the, the 32 here means. And then the last thing we have to do is we have to say, before we run this script here, we have to load the actual method, um, the, the method 4B. 
And so I'm just going to type it in really quick SVL. This is ready to go. I hit submit on this and I'll go ahead and do it. It's going to say, okay, we're going to upload these files and then we're going to run whichever job you told us to do. And that was this method 4B batch file. And we're going to run it with these options here. I'll go ahead and hit okay. It says refer to Envoy. And hopefully my connection here doesn't, doesn't drag too much as it's uploading the files. The files aren't that big, so I don't, I don't think we should have a problem. But now if I go into Envoy, which is the tool Grid Markets distributes, we can see that there is my webinar webinar. It's, it's double name because I gave it the same name for, for the submission in the project. And you can see it's waiting. And after a minute or two, it'll ramp up this Grid Markets machine, and then it'll start running. And in fact, here is a job that I started running while I was, while uh, Doyle was speaking, or I guess 43 minutes ago. And kind of the, one of the things I really like about this Envoy plugin here is it gives you this log. Uh, so it, uh, of course it tells you your, your compute usage and things like that, but it gives you a log. Uh, and this is exactly as if you were running it locally on Mo. These are Mo output messages we're looking at. And so it's not very impressive right now because I only started it uh, 43 minutes ago. But if I go back to PowerPoint, you can see these are screenshots from the, the actual run I did where we looked at those 509 Protex here. And so it's, it's very much as if you're sitting in front of a computer running Mo, which I thought was just a, a very nice way to do things. So that's how we use grid markets. Maybe since I, I did all this work on stat three and that, that's our test case study, let's dig into it just a little bit. Uh, again, this is one of those things I feel I could talk like an hour for, but I do wanna leave some time for Ivan to, to share his results as well. So I'll, I'll try to keep it brief. Um, so as we do that method for B, I told you we combine two different ensembles. And so the math is we had 594 protein protein doc poses in one ensemble over 71,000 confirmations in the second. All against all gives you 42 million plus possible combinations. We don't actually try all 42 million. Some of them are just obviously not going to work. If you have a protect that's kind of all bunched up upon itself, that's just not gonna work. So we, we skip those sort of things. After we do that initial filtering, however, we did end up with uh, one and a third plus million possible ternary complexes that we actually attempted to make. Now. We apply some further filters after we make them to see if they're suitable. So at the end of the day, we got just shy of 100,000 actual ternary complexes from STAT3 and Cerebron combined with 509 Protax. Uh, but we did have to try all 1.3 million combinations to see if they were going to work, work at all. On grid markets, it took three days. And I didn't have my kids yelling how they, how they couldn't get their YouTube to work. So that, that was win-win as far as I'm concerned. Um, you, you can break down these numbers a, a number of different ways. The one I thought was pretty cool was across those 32 threads, we are screening nearly 300 ternary complexes a minute or, or five a second if you prefer, which I thought was pretty neat. At the end of the day, we generated 32 gigabytes of data, which I will note grid markets automatically just re-downloads that back to your local machine without you having to do it manually. So a little bit about the actual results themselves, just if, so we can see this whole exercise was worthwhile. Um, this compound here on the left, SD36, also known as compound 14, is the protact that experimentally they liked the best. Uh, and so you can see there the DC50 here, uh, and then this score is, is method 4B score. It was actually not the most potent compound they found. That was actually compound 19, very slightly better. And we actually, method 4B, very slightly preferred it as well. You see they're very similar, except they only have a, a single carbon to nitrogen switch here. So we found 95 Protax out of those 509 that we thought were better than their compound 14. And we found 19 Protax that were better than any of the ones by our method 4B score in the, in the initial 24 uh, member library. So I'm gonna call those our top shelf predictions. Um, and so one of those, the, the best of the best is actually very much like, very much like one of the initial compounds, compound 20, which has a pyrazole in the linker connected to, to this position on the cerebron binder. All you have to do is take that same pyrazole containing linker, move it over a position, that's new protac, which we call 303, and it has a much better score than either of these kind of best uh, experimental compounds. And so that, that's really, I think that, that's a pretty nice illustration of the fact that you really do have to consider not just the linker in isolation, not just the cerebellum binder in isolation, but the two of them together can have a, a pretty synergistic effect here. 
we can dig into a little bit more the, these 19 protacts here. And I'll say that if we look at the linker link, the regime experimentally that came out had six heavy atoms in the, in the backbone of the linker. Across our top shelf predictions, we actually favor the ones that are a little bit longer, which they evaluated in their initial library because we didn't come up with any new linkers. Um, but it just turns out that as, as you allow the other parts of the protac to, to, to vary simultaneously, it does kind of open up and suggest that these longer linkers might be better if you simultaneously adjust some of the other parts as well. And on top of that, it does suggest a clear direction for further improvement, either with, with more modeling or experimentally. There, there's some rings in here that I don't think have been fully explored. They, they did kind of modify where the, the pyrazole could go. They didn't try putting it in the middle. They, they have a, a piperidine, a single piperidine. There's no piperidine, there's no phenyl. You can kind of slide these rings up and down the linker. I feel like that'd be a promising direction for further optimizing these degraders here. Uh, something interesting about that Cerebron binder, uh, this is the one that they liked experimentally and none of, uh, and I'll show you, a, here, here's a picture of it. This connection point is the one that they landed on experimentally. None of our best of the best, our top shelf protags actually have that connection point. Instead, you, you kind of, some of these other ones get favored. And it turns out that these two here were, were you know, they, they weren't bad in the initial one dimensional scan, but there was also no reason to prefer them. Now, I think we've given a reason. As you look at different linkers and in different other parts of the molecule as well, it does suggest that some of these other linkers, these longer linkers in particular, might be worthwhile. And, you know, we, we have similar findings with the, the other portions of the molecule. I guess I might summarize by, them by saying um, the 1D scan suggested that they're optimized and do this one and you're good to go. I would say that that's not that it's not it's not wrong, but it's also only part of the picture. As you start to optimize the other parts of the protax, some of these other variants are back on the table, and so this might help you as you're looking to optimize properties of your protax, metabolism, things like that. Uh, and so, you know, don't be afraid to kind of tinker with these other positions as well as you're looking uh, if you're allowed to modify all parts of your protax at once. So last slide here, just, this is just kind of a, meant to, to wow you a bit with, with all sorts of colors. Just a summary of all the 509 different protacts. I, I feel like different scientists could look at this and pull out their own lessons. Maybe I'll, ju I'll just highlight one here. Let's look at this, this linker uh, plot up here in the upper left because that, that's really a big part of protact design. Let's focus for right now, excuse me, on the black line. These are the experimental results from that, uh, uh, that one-dimensional library scan here. You can see there, there's a bit of a, I might call it sameness of the, the, the effect of the linker. So they're all kind of like, you know, a, some of the best ones are all like double digit nanomolar. And, you know, a, of course you might pick 19 or 14 because it is just slightly better, but it, it, is, a, it is a slight effect. So based on just that one dimensional scan, you might land on this. But as we start to look at other combinations, it actually turns out that, that linkers 25 and 20 seem to more often give, they, they give you a bit more bang to the, for your buck, more likely to give you productive linkers, uh, or rather, rather productive degraders. So if you were to make some, some backup compounds or some follow-ons or something like that, you might kind of shift away from the ones that they landed on and maybe move towards a, this 20 is the pyrazole containing linker that I showed earlier, for example. So, um, kind of, kind of a, a trivial, but still, I, I think, important observation here. We have a lot of predictions, so there's a lot of data to dive into and to really guide the experiment. So that's the end of my time for today. Uh, I, I put our email on the slide here, and I'm sure once, uh, once I kick it back over to Wendy and Ivan, you will see that, that same email. And I, I'd be happy to take any questions that, that might have come up uh, after, uh, after Ivan has a chance to speak. Thank you. Awesome, Michael, thank you so much for that, that, um, that awesome presentation. Um, next up, it's my pleasure to introduce Ivan Franzoni, PhD, computational chemist with New Chem Sciences. After completing his studies as computational and synthetic organic chemist in Geneva, Switzerland and Toronto, Canada, Ivan joined New Chem Sciences where he applies his mixed experimental and theoretical expertise in medicinal chemistry and drug discovery programs as well as being still an active collaborator with academic groups in Canada, Europe, and China. Ivan will be presenting a case study involving the virtual screening of a large commercial compounds database. 
The aim of the study was to discover novel chemical hits to overcome the limitations with a particularly challenging chemistry in a time and budget critical drug discovery program. Over to you, Ivan. Thank you, Wendy, for your kind introduction. It's uh, my pleasure today to join our colleagues at the Green Market CCG for uh, this uh, webinar. So uh, let me share my screen. Perfect. So I guess you can see the slides. Can do, yep. Perfect. So uh, before diving into our case study today, uh, I would like to spend a couple of words about uh, New Chem Sciences. So uh, New Chem Sciences uh, was founded in 2011 and uh, it's a fully integrated pharmaceutical uh, CRO located in Montreal and Quebec City in Canada that uh, as of today counts more than 200 scientists uh, whose expertise span across synthetic and medicinal chemistry, biology, biochemistry, pharmacology, project management and consultancy mandates. Our, our computational chemistry department works closely with each specialty in our company, provide in silico support to our clients' drug discovery programs from the hit finding, hit to lead and lead optimization stages, as well as chemical development toward the development of uh, novel pharmaceuticals. Today, <clears throat> I'm going to show you how the application of the more computational software developed by CCG and the Grid Markets Cloud Computing Platform brought new life to a particularly time and budget critical project by the identification of novel and readily accessible chemical matter. The project we're going to discuss today uh, immediately presented several challenges related to the somehow exotic nature of this essentially unexplored target protein and the limited prior development of a handful of chemical modulators, mainly derived from complex natural compounds. The goal of this computational study was, to was first to improve our understanding on the binding mode of these complex molecules, and then to apply this knowledge in the identification of novel and synthetically feasible chemical scaffold for the development of new inhibitors for the target receptor. As usual, every time we are faced with a new program here at New Chem Sciences, we first analyze uh, the material provided by our clients and the integrated with our own assessment to fully understand the scientific background, identify challenges and potential pitfalls, as well as define, as define goals and milestones. At the outset of the program, we work closely with our clients to gather as much information as possible to fully integrate their vision into our planning. In this case, the therapeutic approach proposed by the client is completely novel and unprecedented. This this aspect is certainly exciting for medicinal chemists, but at the same time, we were well aware that the lack of prior knowledge may have posed several challenges in the development of novel inhibitors, especially given the strict limitation in terms of time and budget for this program. After roughly uh, 30 days equivalent, for this initial assessment, we were able to propose a path forward, including all the specific details regarding chemistry proposal, budget, timelines, preliminary IP analysis, etc. <clears throat> Our plan was specifically designed, taking into account the three major challenges we identified. The limited, almost non-existent prior studies on the protein of interest, the lack of known inhibitors for this target, and the limited, extremely complex chemical information based on a handful of natural-like compounds obtained mostly via biosynthetic uh, approaches and simple analogs obtained via transformations such as acetylation of hydroxyl groups or reduction of carbonyl moieties to the corresponding alcohols. In terms of prior art, two major scaffolds were known, each of them presenting its uh, unique challenges. The first scaffold is based on a narrow class of natural compounds characterized by the presence of multiple stereocenters and synthesis of analogs for SAR study is critically limited by the necessity to rely on biosynthetic approaches for the preparation of highly advanced intermediates, followed by complex further chemical modifications. The second class of non-inhibitors still resemble natural-like compounds, but the synthesis of analog analogs uh, based on this chemical scaffold was found to be more practical 
and elected as, uh, as leading series, although a number of important limitations were still present. <clears throat> Over a few months, uh, our medicinal chemistry team was able to successfully synthes synthesize few explorative, structurally complex molecules inspired by the limited information reported in the literature. During this initial chemistry development, uh, several practical synthetic challenges were evident. First of all, even after several rounds of chemical planning and brainstorming session, each compound required a complex multi-step synthesis, usually between eight to 15 steps. In addition to this, a late stage functionalization approach, the best and fastest way to prepare a library for, of compounds was not possible. And finally, the particularly low synthetic mod modularity severely limited the possibility to carry out a comprehensive SAR campaign. Despite all these challenges, our chemists prepared a few compounds that were subsequently tested in enzymatic assay developed in-house by our biology team, and they show inhibition activity in the low sub-micromolar concentration ranges. So, although the initial biological results were quite impressive and extremely encouraging, the chemistry side of the program was in urgent need of new directions in order to improve the synthetic turnover, prepare more compounds for testing, and to realign our approach to a critical time-dependent budget. In order to do so and to revitalize the project, we decided to apply our computational expertise in the identification of novel, more chemical and synthetically accessible scaffolds via focused virtual screening campaign. So, uh, our plan for this uh, rescue computational study followed a quite standard approach. At, fir at first, we needed to prepare a model of our target protein for the docking study and identify key requirements for the binding of small molecules to the receptor. At the same time, and based on this analysis, we then proceeded in the selection of commercial compounds to be evaluated in the subsequent, uh, sub subsequent virtual screening. Finally, the docking results were analyzed to identify suitable candidates for testing in our biology laboratories. As it was the case in the previous webinars, also for this target, no public crystal structure were known for, for the human isoform of the protein. We needed to generate an homology model. Using the uh, more utilities and online resources, we first needed to identify suitable templates for the generation of a 3D model structure. The analysis of sequence identities uh, led to the identification of two potential non-human candidates at 38 and 22% sequence identity for the full length protein, going up to 84 and 96% identity for the binding pocket residues. For both templates, a few good quality crystal structures in the hollow state were available, allowing us to apply the homology model builder in Mo to generate our docking model. The different models built by the software were analyzed in terms of geometry, and the final model was further refined and prepared for docking studies. <clears throat> With, uh, with our homology model in hand, we next turn our attention to analyze the binding site and, set, uh, and setting up a docking protocol for the evaluation of commercial compounds. Uh, the binding site of the target protein is characterized by a moderate exposure to the solvent and a, uh, and a good definition as, so, as shown by the low B scores and good electron dens densities in the original co-crystal structure template. The analysis of the pocket electrostatic map in Mo highlighted the presence of a highly lipophilic site. This observation was further supported by the few literature uh, precedent and by the results generated by our biology team. This seemingly critical feature was included uh, in our uh, docking study as a pharmacophore query to ensure the filling of this sub-pocket by hydrophobic moiety from the ligand. In an attempt to validate our model, we tested several docking protocols on the basis of, uh, of literature and internal data. The best results were obtained by the combination of the pharmacophore query, induced fit type calculations, and final scoring with the, uh, of the predicted poses using the GBVI WSA Delta G model uh, developed by uh, CCG. 
while induced feed cal and docking calculations allow for small relaxation of the pocket residues during the minimization step, the, thus improving the fitting of the pores in the binding sites, uh, it also significantly significantly incre uh, increases the overall time required to complete the docking calculations. We next turn our attention to compile a database of commercial, commercial available compounds for the vitreous screening. Once again, we retrieve the in-stock ballport database that includes more than 8 million compounds available at many different suppliers from all around the globe. The full catalog was first reduced to 5.4 million compounds simply based on a drug-like molecular weight below 400 and subsequently analyzed, uh, to analyzed to identify the most relevant compounds for docking. For this purpose, based on our prior analysis of the binding site and the, and the data generated uh, at NUCHEM, we generated specific SMILES query that resulted in the final selection of a bit more than 12,000 compounds, uh, commercial compounds to be evaluated in our docking study. So <clears throat> with our prepared database of 12,000 commercial compounds, an homology model for our target protein and a docking protocol in place, we were in the position to run uh, the docking calculation. The easy to use plugin integrating into more interface allowed for a simple and secure transfer of the batch calculation file from our workstation to the grid market cloud platform, exactly the same way as Michael has just shown us. Once uploaded, the calculation started immediately, leaving our more site license available for other studies. The docking of the 12,000 compounds was completed overnight, and this is especially remarkable, considering that we carried out a significantly more time-demanding induced fit docking calculations. Once completed, the docking results were downloaded via the secure Envoy portal to our local machine, and we began our analysis. Uh, the deta detailed evaluation of the predicted binding poses uh, on the basis of their docking school and visual inspection led to the identification of 240 compounds of interest, representing a 2% of the total uh, of the original data set submitted for docking. In total, the overall time required to submit, run the calculations, and analyze the docking data took less than a day. So the 240 compounds identified by virtual screening were proposed to the client, uh, and uh, after additional evaluation, 41 were purchased and tested by our biology team. We were glad to see that out of the 41 compounds tested, 12 shown a single point inhibition of more than 30%, and three compounds even more than 60%. The last three examples were then submitted to a full dose response curve determination showing inhibition activities uh, up to five macromolar, a good result for a heat compound. Although the molecules previously synthesized a new chem showing IC50 values below 500 nanomolar, the results shown here are extremely encouraging to do, due to the fact that the chemical scaffolds we identified in the present docking study are synthetically readily accessible and are characterized by high level of modularity, exactly what we need for a well-paced SL campaign. Furthermore, these chemical scaffolds are unprecedented inhibitors for the target protein, bringing an additional level of novelty to the program. Overall, the results obtained by our virtual screening provided the boost required for the synthetic chemistry team, and our current efforts are oriented to the preparation of several analogs of these three EAT compounds. In conclusion, the application of the comprehensive MO software and the computing power provided by Grid Markets platform uh, was instrumental in the identification of novel, unprecedented, and synthetically feasible compounds acting as inhibitors for the target protein. The study presented today took an equivalent of two months and a half work among computational and biological studies carried out a new chem. This time includes the preparation of the docking model, the time required to run the calculation on the Greek market clusters, the analysis of the data, as well as the idle time required to, for the compounds to be received by our biology team from the commercial suppliers. In view of the stringent limitations in terms of time and budget, the quick identification and efficient development of readily accessible chemical 
uh, chemicals surely represent a game changer for this challenging drug discovery program, allowing a more productive experimental SAR campaign toward the design of lead, uh, advanced lead candidates. So with this, I uh, conclude my, my part. So Wendy, back to you. Awesome, thank you so much, Ivan. That again also was an incredible presentation. Um, so now we are going to open up the floor for uh, some, some Q&A with the audience. Again, if you have your questions, please drop them into the Q&A uh, section at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Um, and it looks like the first question we have is for you, Ivan. Um, the question is asked is, how did you calculate the hydrophobic region in the HAM mod and the solvent analysis? Okay, um, I'm not sure if I fully understand the question, but uh, so the the hydrophobic site of the bunning, uh, so hydrophobic uh, site we identified in the bunning pocket of this receptor uh, was uh, identified by the uh, the mapping with the tools uh, implemented into the MOS software. So we use the electrostatic uh, mapping that is one of the several uh, maps can be generated by uh, by the MOS software, and also it was further corroborated by the the uh, the limited chemical information we know we knew from the literature so we didn't really use additional uh, additional tools but in terms of solvent analysis also we we double check this with the uh, with the RISM analysis tool uh, still implemented in the most software and uh, that uh, further confirmed that even if the any molecule of water present in that part of the pocket will be easily displaceable by a lipophilic uh, group Awesome. Thank, thank you very much, Ivan. Um, it looks like the next question we have is for Grid Markets, and it looks like it's a specific for Grid Markets co-founder Mark Ross. Um, the question, Mark, is I'm interested in your free trial. How do I get started? You're on mute, Mark. That would be helpful to get off of mute. Thank you. Can you hear me now? Okay. Yes. All right, thanks for the question. Um, I have a, actually, I'll show you a, sli a slide with you. I think it would be probably um, very explanatory if I do. Can you see that slide? All right, great. <clears throat> yeah, so getting started with uh, grid markets is really easy. It's a three-step process. Um, this process is uh, gonna show the most, uh, mo most steps, excuse me. So first step is go to our signup page. You can see at the bottom left corner there, pharma.gridmarkets.com slash signup. Um, there's a screenshot there in the slide and you'll see a create account button. Click that button. Um, there's a very brief form to fill out your first name, last name, uh, email address, and that will result in a free account and also free credits, which will allow you to um, do a trial of the service with no risk. After step one, then you download Envoy, which Michael has referred to in his presentation. Um, there's a button there, download Envoy. And then you install that. And once done, you're ready to go. You should be able to make use of the Grid Markets platform as, as Michael has demonstrated and, um, and Ivan has shown you as well. So hopefully that answers your question. If it doesn't, there's a email address at the end, which you can contact us at and would be happy to elaborate on any other questions you have. Back to you, Wendy. Awesome, thanks, Mark. Uh, looks like our next question is for um, Michael uh, with uh, Chemical Computing Group. Is the ProTac functionality you described available within Mo? And if not, how do I access it? Yeah, that, that's a good question. Uh, it's if, if you just have Mo, um, it, it's it's not going to be something you can find from a menu. Uh, but you can send an email to support at chemcomp.com and we'll, we'll happily send you the, uh, the package. Uh, it, it has all sorts of different methods, including method 4B, like I showed today. It has tools for molecular glues. There's an instruction manual, a tutorial. There's nine nodes. So it, it, it's quite a robust package, but you, you do have to ask for it. There, if you're a Mo customer, there is no extra cost. You, you just have to ask for it. Awesome, thank you very much, Michael. And it looks like our next question is back uh, back to Grid Markets. Um, Mark, this one's for you. How does using Grid Markets compare to using a local cluster? 
Great, thanks again for the question, Wendy. Let me uh, again share my screen with you to answer that. Um, can you see that, Wendy? Yes. Great, okay, so this slide shows how we compare to the two other primary options that are available. One is building your own local cluster, which is this first column here. And the second is effectively building a cloud cluster, your own cloud cluster, perhaps using, for example, AWS. Um, in the case of the setup, it takes, for grid markets, it takes three steps, which I just demonstrated to you in the earlier question. Whereas um, for the local cluster, it's many very complex steps. And even with a uh, in infrastructure option, it's also many complex steps. Um, we talked about the scaling the tokens. Um, in, in the grid markets case, you have unlimited Mo tokens. So you can scale up to however uh, number, number of machines you want to run. Whereas in the case of the local cluster in the AWS option, you have, uh, you're have you limited by whatever your uh, local token count is. Um, same for scaling machines. Obviously with the local solution, you're limited to however, however many machines you have in that local cluster. In the AWS solution, you're limited by whatever your quota is. And in the grid market solution, you're, you're, it's not limited. Um, the setup costs, the maintenance costs, and the uh, in, in the case of the local and AWS cluster are much more expensive compared to grid markets, which is free. There is no setup cost. There is no maintenance cost. There are no one-time costs. And lastly, um, you know, the usage is, in the case of grid markets, is predictable. You have a pretty good sense uh, uh, of how long it's going to take to run. And because we're using a, a cost per machine hour model, which is all inclusive, you can also pretty accurately project what your expense will be for a submission on grid markets. The ROI on grid markets is very high because it's, it's a pay per use model. You only pay for it as you're using it. So hopefully that answers your question. Again, there'll be some um, uh, email uh, addresses that you can contact us with uh, at the end of this if you have any further questions. Hey, Ivan, um, just to let you know, you might want to turn your, your video off because you're the only one who's showing at the moment. So just to let you know. All right, back to you, Wendy. Awesome. Thank you, Mark. Um, looks like the next question actually is for Ivan. Um, Ivan, from the docking, so we'll need you to turn your video back on. From the docking study, you mentioned that 240 commercial compounds were selected, but only 40 were purchased for testing. So it's a, it's a two-part question. Why not test all 240 compounds? And then how did you, how did you further narrow, narrow down the selection to only 40 molecules? Oh, uh, so the first part of the question, it's uh, very, very, very easy to answer. So I, I could not stress, uh, I probably I didn't stress enough that uh, this program was extremely budget critical. So uh, the decision to reduce the number of, comp of commercial compounds to be purchased was uh, mainly uh, dictated by uh, by e economic reasons. So the, we we had to cut the cost for this uh, for this. Uh, uh, for this uh, small screening for compounds. And the way in which we narrowed down the selection from 240 compounds to 41 was mainly done by uh, essentially by visual inspection of the, uh, of the predicted poses to really guarantee that the best fitting of the compounds uh, into the pocket and which compounds that we're looking more at uh, uh, comfortable in the binding site of our homology model. Awesome, thank you very much, Ivan. Um, it looks like the next question we have is for chemical computing group. So back over to you, Michael. Um, the question is, what if I want to compare different protax to degrade different but related proteins? Is that something I can do? Yeah, good, good question. This is, uh, I'll share my screen for this. I, th I think I have something I can show. Um, this is something that I, I think is, is is commonly done, but at the same time, it's a bit underappreciated kind of uh, using protax to uh, to go after selectivity. Uh, and what you have going on is if you look at like a, uh, I, I think my video is back on now. Um, if you look at a protein pocket, it, I'm, I'm just gonna represent it with my hand. Uh, if you have two very closely related proteins, the, the hand might look exactly the same. So it's very difficult to get any selectivity just from targeting a, a, a pocket. But when you have this ternary complex through a protac, um, you, it's not just the pocket. Now you have that second protein, you have the linker kind of guiding where the protein interacts with. 
So it gives you a lot more handles for selectivity. Uh, it is challenging, but it is something we have done. Uh, let's see, I think in, in this, this is actually a, an open access publication. Uh, you could look into just, uh, you know, uh, in Journal of Chemical Information and Modeling, just, just search for my name and Protax or something like that. Um, but let's see, uh, let me page down here. Um, we, we actually go through a lot of different scenarios where we look at different Protax, look at mutants of proteins and things like that. One of the scenarios we go through right here is looking at uh, similar but different uh, proteins, and in this case, it's kinases. Um, and so in this case, it's the same protact molecule, protact, uh, the molecule shown here in B, where the part that binds to your protein is deliberately designed to bind to multiple different kinases. And it can do that because there is a lot of similarity amongst uh, kinase pockets. There's some differences too, but there's a lot, a lot of similarity. Um, and so, you know, without going too much into the results here, we'll just focus on H right here. Um, the ones in green are the ones that experimentally are degradable, and the ones in red were not. And then we're kind of showing the, the predictions on the y-axis. So it turns out our, the one we think with, again, method 4B was the easiest of these kinases to degrade, was a, a big miss. You actually, it, it can't be degraded. We, we have some reasons why we think we missed that prediction. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, you can see that a lot of the, the, the rest of the ones, TBK1, TAC1, INSR, JAC1, they're all down here kind of deprioritized by, by our, our tool here. Um, so this is kind of a hands-on published uh, experience of going after, after selectivity. I've done some work that I haven't yet published looking at just the kinases CDK, uh, so CDK12, 13, 1, 4, 6, 7, and so on and so forth. And, and those results are are, are quite good as well. I, I just can't point them to you because it just exists in like a, an Excel spreadsheet on my computer. Um, but to get back to the answer, yes, you can model different proteins with same or similar protacs. Uh, and and uh, uh, one last note, I guess, on that, a lot of times having that extra variable of, you know, what is the protein, that just adds to the complexity of your model, uh, of the modeling that you have to do. And so having something like grid markets with, with unlimited Mo tokens and, uh, you know, a lot of compute power can, can really help with that as well. Awesome. Thank you so much, Michael. And before we let you get away, we actually have two more questions. I think we can get in if we can kind of keep our, our responses brief as possible. Brief, um, you got it. <laughs> so, just so we can get in everyone's questions. But uh, this is a question for you, Michael. It's that Mo has an alternative to export results like amino acid interactions to manipulate for example, in Python. So does, does, Mo have a, does Mo have an alternative to export results like amino acid interactions to manipulate, for example, in Python? Uh, I, I, I'm, I'm not sure I fully, uh, I'm, I'm not much of a Python guy myself, so I don't know what they're looking for input. I, I will say Mo itself has a lot of uh, import export uh, capabilities with, with standard stuff. And if there's something that doesn't exist, uh, it's something I think we could very quickly plug into if that, that Python tool needs something very specific. Uh, I, I show this on the slide, but Mo has its own programming language, which sounds really dull, and that's why I didn't say it when it was on the slide, but it does help us, it allows us to readily make these new things like the, this interface for the, this Python tool. Uh, so if, if we don't have it, shoot us an email, support at chemcomp.com, and surely we could make it. Awesome. Thank you so much. And the very last question is for you, Ivan. Uh, the question is, you mentioned the, you mentioned the particular lipophilic character of the binding site and how you included this feature in the docking study via a pharm pharmacophore filter. Was the presence of a lipophilic, lipophilic group in the ligand the only requirement for binding, or are there are there additional specific, maybe polar interactions between the compound and the protein that would increase the overall binding affinity? Uh, so the, the lipophilic group on the ligand was a, 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 a very hard requirement for the for the activity of these compounds, and uh, definitely yes, there were other uh, polar interactions in the in the rest part of the uh, of the pocket that were accounted for uh, during the evaluation of the uh, during the analysis of the docking results. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, unfortunately, that's all the time we have for questions today. They were great questions. We would like to thank our presenters and you, our audience, for joining us today. 
we invite you to continue the conversation with us via the contact information that is on your screen currently. We also would like to invite you and look forward to seeing you on April 21st for the second webinar of our scientific visualization series with Kate Zagararis, scientific visual effects artist. Registration can be found on our Grid Markets Pharma upcoming webinars page. And again, we'd like to thank you very much for joining us today and we look forward to seeing you in April for our next Grid Markets Pharma webinar. Thank you and have a great day.